Okay, well, I'll tell you what then. Let's, let's go now and talk a little bit about this history of this group. Get a, get a deeper sense of it. I touched a little bit on this last night, but I want to now further elaborate a bit on it. You may recall that last night I, I mentioned to you that we are told in the esoteric philosophy that the, 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 that the, the masters meet in conclave every 100 years. Recall that? And that, that, um, that, that usually happens on the 25th year of the century. Uh, and the, the reason for those gatherings is to come to some sort of energetic uh, uni united perspective on what to do to help humanity and the other kingdoms of nature move forward in their next step. And so they're thinking in big hundred year cycles. And in the, f in the conclave that happened in the 1400s, there was, you know, it is said that separative consciousness reached its apotheosis at that time. Separative consciousness, as, as the Tibetan would say, it marks the summation of separativeness at that time. And that um, the hierarchy began to contemplate the next step and began to consider the possibility of, as I said, is it possible that this next step in, in terms of bringing humanity closer to the hierarchy or bringing the hierarchy closer to humanity, is it possible that finally, after such a long time of the hierarchy being out of form, that can it be the time to bring it back into form? And as I said, there was, I, I think they, they, they sort of tabled it till the next meeting. <laughs> but that in, by the 15th, uh, 1500s, that gathering apparently is where there was a decision to begin the process of a, of an, a subjective formation of an inner group, a subjective formation. It wasn't externalized. It was the beginning, the training process to hasten the urge of integration, as it is said, to hasten the urge of integration and to begin to train a band of disciples to work as a unit, to work as a unit and to um, prepare that group of disciples for an eventual collective united externalization as the forerunner to the whole process. So it really, the, the beginnings of the subtle trainings along this took place several hundred years ago. And um, one of the big things about this was it was all about this absolute insistence that this group must begin what is called the development of scientific brotherhood. Scientific brotherhood. In other words, it's not a group that is based upon sentimentality at all. It's not about liking each other. It's about re re realizing that it's about the development of the mind and the higher mind uh, as a important instrument that that group must utilize to be effective in the centuries to come when it becomes more externalized. Because you see, think about this. We're talking about the age of Aquarius. Remember, as I said last night, that at that time the masters could see the light of Aquarius dimly on the horizon and that they saw that this may be the opportunity. And so as they're moving forward in the centuries, they're seeing that light getting closer. But what is Aquarius anyway? Number one, it's an air sign, not a water sign. It's not water, even though it sounds like water. Air is always mind. And importantly, we're talking higher mind, not lower mind, higher mind. So there are people out there that say to you, will say to you, the mind is your enemy. Somehow the mind is preventing you from spirituality. Get the mind out of the way. And that, and that the mind is the slayer of the real. Esotericism says, what? The mind isn't the slayer of the real. The slayer of the real is the lower mind, but the higher mind is the revealer of the real. But there's been a long history 
of the idea that, that your mind is your enemy and get it away and just think in terms of the heart. Well, the heart is really important. That, that goes without saying. The new group of world servers are filled with heart. We've had centuries of development around the, the principle of love, and there's always more to do there. But the development of the mind as the rightful consort, the rightful companion to the, the heart, is absolutely essential. So the notion that the mind is the problem is really an absurd notion. And it's very common, particularly in the New Age movement. The lower mind is a problem because that is a separative aspect of mind. But the higher mind is your greatest gift. And never forget, your causal body is found on the higher mental plane. And it's made up of intelligent mental substance, but it's also made up of un unbelievably refined particles of love. And so, you know, even, even in, in some of the occult literature, the causal body and the solar angel, which is the, the, said to be the intelligence that is providing you substance for your causal body, that, that sometimes they're called the manasaputras. Manas, manas, manasa. Manas is the word for mind. The great bringers of mind. So it's one of those areas that I think have to, has to really be adjusted because there's a wrongful attitude out there about that. But the new group of world servers understands that. They understand that your higher mind is a gift to be consort to the heart and that the two must work together and that equal, they are equally sacred, just different. And the heart is that part of us that comes, helps us to come on rapport with the unitive field and the, the love principle of divinity. But the mind, when rightly oriented, the higher mind, is the instrument that makes it possible to receive divine ideation from the greater life. Who's to say one's better than the other? But also, mind is needed as a creative agent. We can't really externalize anything unless we think it through. We build ideas. Remember, humanity evolves through its relationship to ideations. We, we have new ideas. They're wonderful. They, we find ways of applying them in different social systems and they enrich us all and they facilitate evolution. But those attitudes then outlive their usefulness eventually and we adopt, we try to shift to a higher paradigm, the next paradigm. All of human evolution is just the evolution of our relationship to ideation over, the, over hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years. So, but what this philosophy is trying to say is that more and more behind the scenes, a greater agency, the hierarchy, is actually giving impulse to higher ideation. And that all the great innovations in history, all of them, from the most primitive innovations going back to when we were just surviving and the innovations to, you know, to develop even tools at the very beginning of our existence had an inspirational source back then. There's always been an inner government, an inner intelligence that is trying to facilitate unfolding understanding. This, but this group that is forming now in history, this group is a group that has a more conscious recognition of that, conscious understanding of it, conscious understanding of the principle of how to get into more right alignment with that inner government. So in 15, the 1500s, this idea was to begin the process of developing this group. And then since that time, group activities have been nurtured in all the departments, all the departments, whether we're talking politics, science, the arts, all of them, all of them. You know, the Tibetan says that some of the great initiatives that were impulsed by, by uh, uh, the hierarchy was even the, the French Revolution and the American Revolution were impulsed by this greater life. 
That means that it can even impulse something that leads to war, if it has to. <coughs> Some of the greatest disciples uh, uh, were people that were playing out in those, those conflicts. You know, in, the, in America, you take a person like Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, those were incredible initiates that, that it's, you know, that it's hard to fathom their connection to the greater life. And you've had them in your culture as well. The greatest inspirational heroes of your culture um, that have made such a difference in the upliftment of your culture undoubtedly were being inspired by the hierarchy as well. And they may not have known it. They may have, but they may not have. But that's the idea behind all of this. So then, in the, in the last conclave of 1925, as I mentioned last night, that's when it became public. That's when the group was brought forward into a more formal presentation, a formalized expression in the outer world. It began then. It began then. And the Tibetan refers to them as a band of conditioning souls, a band of conditioning souls. And from that point, it's been growing ever since, ever since. And each decade, there are more members of the group. Each decade, they are finding themselves in every category of human expression, all the departments, every nation, every culture, some of them come, are, are, are guided into conditions of absolute poverty and are working in those, those environments. Some are, have wealth, but understand that their wealth is, is for the purpose of serving the greater whole and utilizes those resources as a part of their service. Everywhere, they're everywhere, you see? But behind the scenes, they're normally not the group of people that get all of the attention in the media. They occasionally do. But it's usually often what gets attention in the media is the um, integrated personalities who are not yet fully or even really recognizing a deeper impulse. I'm generalizing, of course. There are some really advanced souls that have clearly public uh, visibility. but. Sometimes I think our media tends to be, to fa it favors the, the, the step below that, which is integrated personality without soul awakening yet. Okay? So, any questions on this? Anything you'd like to get clarified? Yeah? Could you list the attributes of the lower mind as not opposed to what versus the higher mind? Well, okay. So, okay, so her question is, what is the contrast between the lower mind and the higher mind? Okay. For the lower mind is the part of the mind that is analytical. It's the part of the mind that is 100% rational. Uh, I mean that kind of in the lower sense, but it's the, it's the, it's the mind that thinks in strictly cause and effect analysis. It's the mind that is very linear. It's the mind that wants to, when it finds a truth, the truth is very much a truth. It is a truth, but it's often a truth that has a very narrow application, and yet it is a truth. It's the mind that tends to toward understanding things through a separative perspective. It's the mind that says this, not that. It's the mind that tries to break things apart and, 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 and understand something through the breaking and separating and, and, um, and, and re what sometimes is called um, reductive consciousness. Reduce things to their parts and then some understanding can be achieved. The lower mind is um, the, the mind of the personality, actually. It is, it is an integrated personality, which is a powerful force in the world, is often integrated around the lower mind. The personality it is, is much, very much identified with the intellectual mind, the integrated personality, that is, okay? Now, in contrast, the higher mind, the higher mind is the abstract mind. 
It's the mind that sees larger principles. It's the, lar the, mi the part of your mind that can look at a, a variety of events and instead of isolating on all the events in, spec in specificity, can actually discern larger truths that encompass all of those events. Larger patterns. The, the higher mind is the mind that sees the underlying blueprints, the blueprint behind things. Your higher mind is the mind that sees truths that are, have wide application. The lower mind sees truth in a very narrow application. <coughs> and the lower, there's nothing wrong with the lower mind. Actually, we need it. We need it. It's absolutely essential. And it's, it's essential that it be developed before the higher mind. It's in the nature of evolution that, that that's how it goes. We become intellectual, integrated, analytical personalities before we awaken to this higher thing that's also behind the scenes, the higher mind, and eventually the causal mind. Uh, the causal mind is, not only is it your higher mind, but it's also the, the mind that has stored wisdom from the past. So actually there are three minds if you want to get technical about that. There's the concrete mind, which I've just described. There's the abstract mind that's sensing and, see, and seeing larger principles. Often it's the philosophic mind. And then there's the so-called, in ancient literature, it's called the son of mind, S-O-N, son of mind, which is an arcane language around the causal body and the wisdom in the causal body. That's the, that's the mind as it's been acquired through experience. So both the, both the, the son of mind, the, soul, the soul's mind, and the higher mind, they have one thing in common. They both have, they're both related to abstractions of wisdom, or abstractions, sorry, abstractions of, of, of ideations. The difference is that the causal mind, that's the mind of your soul, also has the feature of experientialness to go along with it. The abstract mind in its own right, by itself, is needing to be developed and is extremely useful, but it is, it's, just, it's still high-level ideation without experience to, to give it certainty of, of, of truth. Whereas your causal mind is, is holding those abstract principles that have been earned through the crucible of many incarnations of life experience. So this is, in, in a technical sense, there's three parts to the mind. So a long answer to your question. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? No, I just wondered if there, you know, you said before with monks and nuns and priests, and now we're in the community, the integration mm -hmm. in the community. And your teacher here. The will to do. The will to do. The will to do. Yeah, well, if you're talking about the group, new group, okay, her question is, I think, I'm not sure what your question is actually, but I think what you're saying is, you're asking me, is the new group of world servers right in the world, right doing, their, doing in the outer world, as opposed to the isolative tendencies of uh, the convent? And yes. is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. In many ways, think of the new group of world servers as the emerging group of practical mystics. For a long time, we were in the age of mysticism. We've been in the age of mysticism for a very long time. Throughout most of the age of Pisces, it's been a mystical tendency. There has been a bias in the understanding that the way to find God is through the heart and less about the mind, and the way to do that is to isolate yourself and, and go into a cloistered environment and go behind, the, in the highest sense or the most intense sense, go behind the conflict walls and become contemplatives and, and separate yourself from the world, which is the world of the flesh and the devil, which is, in Christianity, has been viewed as historically kind of the enemy, where the devil is found. That's the Piscean way. But this is now the entrance into a new way, and the practical, the, 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 uh, the new group of world servers are, are the, those people who are awakening to this new way, and this new way is to become practical mystics. So there's a tremendous amount of love. There's a, com there's a tremendous amount of alignment with the love of the greater life. But there's also an alignment with the intelligence of the soul and the intelligence of the greater life. And there's a commitment to, to outward turn. Instead of moving toward a cloistered approach, 
to isolate. Instead, it's about moving right into the world, into culture, into civilization, recognizing that that's not, where, that's not the world, the flesh and the devil in a negative sense, that every society, all, all social institutions are categories of human consciousness manifesting as institutions. Each has a higher nature, each has a lower nature, each is struggling as a category of consciousness to evolve to a higher order. And practical mysticism and the new group of world servers are people that sense that and are immersing themselves in culture, in civilization, to try to facilitate the evolution of the soul of those institutions. So it's much more grounding. It's much more be in the world and recognize that society isn't your enemy. But the enemy is not society. The enemy is the lower tendencies of society. The enemy isn't, like I mentioned yesterday uh, when I um, discuss the idea that often people say the, the problem is government's the problem. But no, it's not. It's the lower tendencies of government, yes. But not. what about the higher tendencies of government? It's that capacity to start realizing that everything out there is dual, just like you and I. That's the new group of world servers. They're the people that must see the duality in those social institutions, recognize the soul that's struggling to express itself through those social institutions, and recognize that their role is to be an agent in support of the evolution of that soul. And the only way you can see that soul is if you can see it in yourself. Soul sees soul, personality sees personality. Anyway, it's a really important concept and we'll get there. We're just, you know. Yes. So the question is, um, does this suggest that in the past we might have been priests or nuns and now we're moving into this arena? And, and it's a, as a generalization, yes. Generally, yes. It uh, doesn't mean that any one of us, every one of us have, has lived in the convent. But the bias of consciousness has been historically to, to find God through isolation. What's so interesting about that is that the Tibetan says something interesting about it. He says, he says, you know, that's a sixth ray focus, a Piscean focus, and it was absolutely necessary. Absolutely necessary. Because it was necessary to first find and that divinity, inwardly yearn, mystically connect. And to, when, when it's beginning to really try to take hold in the human kingdom, that process, it does require isolation. It does require pushing all the distractions of the outer world and even if necessary believe those distractions to be evil in order to give yourself the environment necessary to make those connections. That, but the, it's, the Tibetan says this, that impulse was essential and it could be viewed as the nursery of soul development, the nursery. And just as like a mother, by analogy, a mother who's had a baby that mother is going to have the baby in the nursery and is going to go out of her way to protect that baby from anything in the environment that could have any kind of distracting adverse effect to give that child an opportunity to grow and stand on its own feet. And by analogy, that's exactly what the Piscean Age has been about and what the whole mystical trend has been about. To, prov to provide, it's the nursery, it's to provide the protection necessary for us to really discover the divinity that is uh, mystically oriented. But guess what? That's 2,000 years ago. It's time to leave the nursery. It's time to get on with it now. We're growing up here. It's time to get on with it. So, any other questions? Does this sort of make sense to you? Just in a, just a general way of looking at it. Okay. See, and this doesn't matter, it doesn't, the beauty of this is it's not, it's not governed by theology. There's nothing in what I'm saying that is theology. Um, th this is not about church. This is not about, there are, there are as many people in the Buddhist stream who are esotericists and who are practical mystics as there are in the Christian stream. And, and, or, or the Islamic stream, 
or the non-stream, or the people that aren't affiliated with any theology. That's the wonderful thing about the esoteric philosophy. It, to me, it, it rises above theology. It sees everything as spiritual. Everything is spirit in, in, in evolution. So, um, and that's why I said last night that one of the biggest obstacles to the future and to the emergence of the hierarchy in, in the future is that um, fundamentalist theology is actually a great obstacle. But it's not just fundamentalist theology, it's also fundamentalist anything. Fundamentalist politics, fundamentalist education, fundamentalist business. What is fundamentalism? It's the most, it's, 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 it's sort of literalism. It's, it's the habit of the old. The greatest obstacle for our future is the past. The, the enemy of the future is the past. The enemy of the future is, is the past ideas that we have, are afraid to let go of in order to adopt the next paradigm to move forward. And the new group of world sit, servers stand in the middle. They sense the new paradigm. They see the past ideas. They see the, re the resisting force of the past ideas, but they see where it's supposed to go. They're not jumping over here and saying, I'm going to do this. They're standing in the middle and saying, I got to work this out between these two forces. That's what they're doing. <coughs> and I'll, I'll, um, I'll tell you what, we're going to take a break here in a couple minutes. And I, I think after break, I'll just, I'll show you another way of looking at this. I'll dramatize it a little bit for you. So you get to see exactly what this new group is doing what their role is in the larger scheme, particularly at this incredibly interesting period of time, because we are in a really, really important period. We're in what is called the burning ground phase, that humanity is in a burning ground period that is always the prelude to a great initiatory opportunity. Humanity stands close to a great initi initiatory opportunity. And and always there is crisis at its front door. And that's what's happening. And the only group that can solve the crisis is the new group of world servers. You're going to feel the weight of responsibility today. <laughs> but there should be joy along the way. Okay? 